Welcome everyone to the session today. And um, as you know, these are our standing brown bags that we have under uh, the Carfi Carbon Finance Collab under the CIFAR Alliance. And um, as you know, the CIFAR Alliance is a now 19 member organization of leading DFS uh, fintech or uh, actors that are uh, addressing the intersection of climate resilience and adaptation with um, vulnerable populations. So we're really excited to have Vera with us today and uh, maybe just some background the intro for this webinar. If you, oh yeah, and please keep, continue to introduce yourselves in the chat. Uh, it's a bit of a moving target who attends and, and who's who. So for the benefit of everyone getting to connect to one another and, and being aware, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, and so I'm really pleased to welcome Vera. We actually met with, um, I connected with the team at COP, so it was great to invite and have them confirm participation today. As you all know, Vera is a leading, um, the leading uh, standards organization in climate action and sustainable development. It's also the biggest certifier through the uh, voluntary carbon, uh, excuse me, the verified carbon standard. Uh, so it's the largest certifier of uh, voluntary carbon offsets. And um, Vera also operates the registry for the implementation of those VCN, VCS programs. It acts as the central repository for all the information related to projects and units, and it ensures uh, to help ensure that the projects are unique and the credits are accounted for as such. And uh, Vera is based in DC. It's a small site. Well, actually, I don't know how many employees you have um, in Vera. How many are you today? Over 160 something. Okay. Yeah. So a small, but not small, a sm a small or not small uh, size nonprofit based out of DC. Um, so I'm really pleased to, to welcome Vera's uh, team to cover three areas around how Vera has been evolving, especially with more digital approaches on the MRV side, the measurement reporting verification, as well as how Vera seeks to work with ecosystem actors given this is a market and area that's been around for almost the last 30 years or more, and how it hopes to engage with project developers, as well as where they see the future of the VCM headed. This is always something we're, we're interested in, um, especially with respect to standards and, and the, the main issues around transparency. So I'd like to welcome Venkatesh Sharma. He's the Senior Director of Technology Solutions at Vera. He leads the technology strategy across the organization including innovation for MRV, which we'll hear about today, um, program digitalization, expanded registry functionality, and linkages to external actors. And we also have Justin Willer from um, Vera as a senior director of the VCM program development. He coordinates and updates the VCM program and methodology uh, development in coordination with the innovation team. So both are very close, as you can imagine, to how Vera is evolving after being almost 20 years in the sector, right? You guys were there at the beginning. Uh, well, so let me pass um, the time to uh, Bengtish and Sharma. We have a presentation for you. And um, you guys let us know how you wanna take questions. Uh, we try to keep it pretty flexible and open. And then um, if not throughout the presentation, we'll take questions at the end. So, awesome. Green? Yes. Yes, please. Thank you, everyone. Uh, see, give, uh, Jane gave a nice introduction about ourselves, so we don't have to talk more about ourselves here, but feel free to ask questions in the meantime. So we have outlined about uh, nine, 10 slides just to as a reference, and then we'll go over DMRV, how we are engaging and how VCM is developing from the Vera's perspective. And Justin and I will be switching hats around and answering any questions we may have. And the title is fairly simple, Exploring Vera's Role and Innovation in the Evolution of Voluntary Carbon Market. Next slide, please. Vera, I mean, some of you may know carbon credits, but we do more than carbon. So we have four standards, verified carbon standard, uh, nonprofit in environmental and social impacting, sustainable development framework, uh, climate, community, and biodiversity standards. 
So the carbon credit is just one piece of what Vera does. Um, so far, we have issued over a billion credits done equivalent, and there is a plastic program which is missing from this slide. So next slide, please. Um, topic for discussions are our DMRB, engaging project developers, and a vision for harmonization of standards and future of the VCM. Um, Justin, do you want to add something in this? No, why don't you go ahead and do your side spank test and then I can speak okay. a little more. Awesome. Um, I will be talking a little bit about DMRV. Next slide, please. Uh, to start with, you know, DMRV, which is digital measurement reporting and verification, may mean many things to many people. So we're going to limit the scope to what we think at Vera and what we are building, which is a range of digital technologies, tools, or software application that can perform MRV function in automated manner. So that is to say, MRV, we have been doing MRV for the 20 years, and many people have been doing for uh, similar functions over multiple decades in environmental sector, and we are trying to digitalize them. And MRV is really used for originality, baseline, project, leakage, and reversals in the carbon world. And why we are opting for digital MRV is because of the fact that the manual process of or analog process are costly, slow, error prone, inconsistent, inefficient, and all the things that uh, we can avoid with the digital technologies. And so DMRV will make things efficient at Vera's uh, process. It will be more reliable, more accurate, replicable, and then it will allow us to automatically analyze data and get some transactions and insights and processing. And at the end of the day, what we want to do is facilitate certification at the system level. If we have such a system that can do measurements, reporting and verification, if we can go from project level certification to platform level certification, then any projects moving through those DMRVs or certified platform can be uh, considered verified or validated where accuracies are checked and all the process are um, automated. That's the rationale for DMRV. Next slide, please. So this is a very schematic diagram of a DMRV system where we have projects, whether it's uh, nature-based uh, solutions or industrials or renewables, and there will be digital measurement platforms that can make use of sensors, manual data collections, IoT devices, and that will be transformed into a unified data so everybody knows what the data is. And then the system could check for accuracy utilizing algorithms, machine learning, and then calculation is happening inside the system itself and reports are produced. If we find any errors, we can alert. And that alert is key to automation of certification. For example, a DMRV software can actually look at the data and make a judgment saying, this looks good, this doesn't look good, and I don't know if it is good or bad. So in that case, we can have automated uh, acceptance, automated rejections, or let's trigger manual process because we don't know uh, the data enough. So this could cause, um, this could be because of the fact that we haven't seen that project before, for example, or some abnormal data was found. So that's our digital MRV system. So what I say platforms as a plural, because Vera is not creating one. We are facilitating creation of such a platform. So multiple people could be, multiple entities could be offering their solutions and then they all can understand each other. So that's the unified system. Uh, next slide, please. So potential promise of this digital transformation is market scaling enabled through digitalization. Now, you, we don't have to do, if you look at uh, Vera's program, everybody is doing some sort of MRV in their own way. So this will enable scaling. So if I build something, I can offer that to others. And finance, mobilization of finance in accelerated climate actions, the process will be much more shorter. So we have much more um, uh, ability to, to proceed with what we want to do at a faster rate. 
and that means finance can accelerate. Not exclusively digital. So when we think about digital, we won't be getting 100% digital on day one. So it will be a mixture of analog MRV and uh, BCU-based investment will continue. Some of the things cannot be digitalized right away. And then we are going, we are engaging with the DMRB working group who are providing us guidance on the future of DMRB. And we are going to make use of widely available systems that are publicly in public domain. So we are not reinventing the wheels. If some things are there, we are using them. If some things are not there, we are creating them. So there is a timeline of how we are proceeding with it. So first step is are our templates digitally available? So if we digitalize those templates, then it's available for to everybody for use. And then that's what we're doing. And then we are digitalizing the methodologies. And processing analysis are happening in the system itself. And there is a DMRV work where data collection is happening. People are utilizing sensors and we are creating systems so that we can read those sensor data. And we will be looking at how we can make the validation and verification much more efficient. And the greens mean the green boxes means we have completed those for at least 18 methodologies. And certification of platform, uh, we are working with several platforms, and then at least we have uh, several proposals of how we can certify such a platform. Uh, this will be taken to a broader working group to and then public consultation, and we have to create rules with the Justin's team to say this is how the platform certification could work, and then issuance of the credit happens. And then there is the other side, the external facing uh, systems that can tokenize uh, VCUs so we can do further processing, and there is a decentralized finances where financial actors or players could come in and make use of those VCUs. Next slide, please. Now, I'll leave that to Justin, and then I can chime in if needed. Uh, before you do that, uh, we switch to Justin. Um, maybe just pausing and inviting the, the audience to ask any questions um, from the work you're doing on, on DMRV. I also threw a question into the chat, and maybe I start us off. Uh, I was asking how the, the digital approach or the workflow compared to the way you were working prior how that has shortened the time to certification for project developers. So to, to answer that question, we just launched the pilot program on digital submission. And so far the feedback has been great. There is no error in uh, calculations. And the feedback is that uh, when we don't have error in calculation, when we don't have error because of the missing data and parameters, the process is already efficient because we don't have to check for it. Um, uh, we will be getting metrics on those, but uh, this is not yet fully um, in the production. We are still testing with the stakeholders as a pilot. But so far, um, in the system that we have built, there is no need for completeness check. Every document that is needed for a program is uh, checked. So we did that for uh, the non-permanence risk tool digitalization where everything is checked. Once you submit, there is no problem of bad data, missing data, or missing document information. So when we have that, the review process will be much more efficient. Thank you. Okay, Justin. Thanks, Jane. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so we had a couple of specific questions and then happy to take more general uh, questions too. So one of the questions was around what do we do to engage with, with project developers? Um, there's a lot happening on this front, some of which, a lot of which is outside of Bank Tesh's and my team. Um, so I can speak a little bit about it and then we can always get back to you if there's questions we can't answer. Um, so engaging with project developers is a key part of, of what we do. We need them to understand our, our rules and requirements and our templates and everything so that they're submitting good quality uh, documentation for their projects and so that they are able to do, do good projects on the ground. Um, we've just stood up a new stakeholder and 
well, a new stakeholder team and regionalized our our more general stakeholder engagement team. Um, so this will provide enhanced kind of responsiveness and an on the ground presence in in each of the main regions around the world. So, you know, South Asia, East Asia, Africa, um, South America, Latin America. So that's really exciting. And we're already seeing results from that in terms of improved government engagement, a lot more stakeholder presence. Um, there's, we've also just started the Vera Project Hub. That's a project that Bank Tesh led as part of the broader digitization effort. So anyone who has a request in, in process where they've submitted a, a pipeline listing request or a registration or a um, issuance request, verification approval request, they can kind of see as it goes through the, the internal processing and quality assurance steps that, that Vera conducts. Um, so that reduces the need to send emails constantly to say, you know, what's happening with my project improves the visibility, but it also provides a really important data metric for us where we can see our processing times for each of the different types of, of requests and, and manage the outcomes um, on those processing times. So that's really exciting. We have a number of working groups we always have, um, but particularly active right now, we just restarted our VCS program advisory group. Uh, so that's a group of kind of cross cross sectoral experts. So some government reps, some VVBs, some project proponents, some uh, buyer side, some investor side, um, and some sort of observer, like not NGO type uh, folks, a really impressive group of of experts that are advising us on anything they want, but we're regularly bringing to them kind of major proposed program program updates, program development topics to, to get their input um, as part of the early development process. Uh, so not a decision-making body, but a very strong advisory role. Um, we also then have topic specific uh, advisory or working groups. So there's one on, on uh, digitized, digital tools or something, I think. There's a forest carbon working group, there's a blue carbon working group, there's a enhanced weatherize, weatherization of minerals working group. So, you know, from the very general to the very uh, specific um, and lots on the sustainability side as well. A very active one on our new uh, nature framework under the SD Vista program. Um, so those are all listed on our website. I'm not sure if you can click the link there, but if you go to vera.org and then just go under advisory groups, uh, you'll be able to see that. Um, the project developer forum is not a Vera group. It's a independent group of project developers that kind of advocates on behalf of, of project developers to all the standards, but we have a regular interaction with them. So we have standing meetings where we're interacting with them regularly. They would re represent, I don't know the exact fraction, but probably over half of the the volume in the VCS. So most of the larger project developers are represented there and they're regularly giving us feedback on what they're seeing on the ground, what we could do to enable them to take more, take more climate action. Um, so that's a great group. For methodology development, uh, every methodology development has a public consultation. We also regularly strike working groups or, or work with external partners on methodology development. We often have expert consultants that are working on that too. Um, so you can check out the consultations there. Some of our methodologies like the CCS methodology that's under development have more of a formal consortium uh, that's involved in, in that development process too. Um, and then finally, public consultation. So there's public consultations on every single VCS project uh, before it can get registered. It has to go through public consultation. There's public consultation on every new or revised major revisions um, methodologies, not if we're just like updating a template or something, but if it's anything substantive, we take that to consultation. And then also our program updates, um, all go to all the major ones go to pro, um, public consultation. So we'll have another one of those coming up soon uh, for the next version of the VCS. You can jump to the next slide, Bengtesh. Um, so a few words about kind of where the VCS is and where it's going and, and where the market is going more generally. So uh, the Integrity Council for Voluntary Carbon Markets is what ICVCM uh, stands for. And VCMI is the Voluntary Carbon Market Integrity. I think there's another I in there, initiative or something. Um, 
but we, we typically call it VCMI. Uh, so one of those is uh, program side and one of those is more buyer side. ICVCM is more uh, program side. So they published last year their core carbon principles. This group came out of the uh, task force for scaling voluntary carbon markets that was uh, struck at the COP a few years ago and led by Mark Carney, kind of morphed into this, this theory of change of build integrity and scale will follow. Um, so Vera was very involved in, in that, participated in all their consultations. Our, our former CEO sat on their board uh, representing the voluntary carbon markets um, so Vera announced that it had applied to the ICVCM in November um, and that followed a number of important program updates that we did in August to align with the core carbon principles. We were already mostly aligned so a lot of it was clarifications but there were a few important pieces in there like um, a step change uh, enhancement in the transparency of our safeguards so we always had a do no harm um, kind of general requirement for VCS projects, but now we've articulated it that you have to specifically assess and report on your risk related to community impacts, ecosystem impacts, um, and, and more clear requirements on stakeholder engagement. Um, so that's what's happening with ICVCM. We're very hopeful that we'll hear in the next uh, month or so about the program assessment and then the um, categories of credits are working through their process. So some of them are already with the Secretariat and we expect to hear about those, that first tranche uh, in the next month or so, maybe two months. Um, and then a bunch of others have been referred to multi-stakeholder working groups, which Vera is participating on and the other standards and kind of experts in each type. So there's like a forest carbon uh, working group um, and, and similar uh, like looking at biochar and cook stoves and things like that. Um, so each of those will proceed on their own schedule and, and we'll likely see kind of rolling announcements over the course of this year and potentially even into next year uh, for those different credit types. Um, so I think that answers the question you just put in the chat there, Jane. Um, on Article 6, so that was one of the questions, is what's happening on Article 6? So we have enabled Article 6 labels in the VCS. Uh, so this falls under the umbrella of Article 6.2, so cooperative approaches between uh, jurisdictions, not going through the, the formal Article 6.4 carbon market. Um, so we have our first credits that have been labeled. The first ones came out just during COP, I guess. Uh, and then we have a few more kind of regularly coming in, uh, letters of authorization that projects have negotiated with host parties uh, to be able to transact their their credits under Article 6. So it's a commitment, a letter of authorization is basically a commitment from the host country to make corresponding adjustments. These are optional. Article 6 labels are not required for VCS projects. They are required uh, for the next phase of Corsia compliance though. Um, so it's an important there. And also obviously if you're going to count it towards um, an NDC, then it has to be Article 6 labeled. So the Singapore uh, carbon market is an example of a compliance system that has allowed for VCS credits to be used, but requires them to be Article 6 labeled, I believe. Um, so that's certainly an emerging trend, but at this point, a, very, a relatively small slice of, of the overall VCS volume. Article 6.4, um, so we obviously follow it uh, closely. It, it did not reach consensus on uh, some of the key decisions that were needed at COP. So now it's bumped to the next COP. Um, obviously unfortunate and disappointing for those that were looking to participate in Article 6.4. Didn't really impact us directly, I wouldn't say, for, for good or, or bad. I mean, it's always too bad when the COP process doesn't reach consensus on, on key decisions. Um, but the work is still happening in the background. So a number of the methodologies are still, they're doing consultations and developing methodologies. They just won't have a formal mechanism to, to formally issue methodologies and start issuing credits uh, until they can reach consensus on some of those key decisions. There's still a supervisory body that's up and running. So um, we're monitoring that. Um, we would love and plan to align with key aspects of that. So an example would be, for those of you that are familiar with cook stoves, they are consulting on their cook stoves meth um, 
in in collaboration with the Clean Cooking Alliance, which is kind of a group of experts that's in a different part of the UN, but trying to bring together industry and the standards. Um, so we've released our own cook stove, updated cook stove methodology for consultation. And in that methodology, we've stated that we plan to align with the standard factors for the fraction of non-renewable biomass, which is a key factor that determines the amount of credits you get for a cook stove project. Um, so we would plan to align with, with where the, the UNFCCC and Article 6.4 goes on that. So that's an example of sort of moving towards alignment, working in partnership, but still not waiting for 6.4. We're still moving ahead with our own um, work in the meantime. Um, and then, sorry, just quickly, the, the next thing that's coming for the VCS is version five. So in August of 2023, as I mentioned, we released updated uh, version 4.5 of our standards. So that was a large, but still technically a minor update um, of the VCS. So that was adding on some requirements and clarifying some requirements, but trying to keep as much as possible uh, that need, didn't need to change exactly the way it was. Um, for version five, this is more of a step change um, type of update. So if, if I were to use a house analogy, version 4.5 is sort of like changing the flooring, doing a deep clean, you know, doing some landscaping, that sort of thing. Version five would be a deep energy retrofit. So, you know, looking at the fundamentals of the program, everything from scope and principles and approach to additionality through to the, the user experience end. So some of the digitization stuff that, that Bank Tesh's team is leading um, to make sure all of the rules and requirements and procedures and templates are sort of fit for purpose for the future of of what the carbon market needs and that what that need is is an increase in both the integrity and the usability and and the impact we need you know at least a 10x scaling of the voluntary carbon market and the vcs needs to play a key role in that to get anywhere close to global climate ambitions um, so we take that very seriously and we're really excited to get to that next stage there'll be a series of consultations on that the next one will come Hopefully April Q2 of this year is, is the plan for the, the next round of consultations on that. And then because it's a full redraft of the documents, um, we would plan to have a subsequent consultation on the actual uh, documents. So that means that implementation of the fully updated version five would likely come uh, in early 2025. We have a number of programs under development separate from that. Um, so our audit and accreditation team is developing an accreditation standard. Our scope three program is under development. So that's focusing on within value chain reductions and ensuring that there's a clear and transparent accounting system that aligns with best practices there that doesn't have double counting with, with the VCS program. Um, and then our sustainable development colleagues um, are doing updates on the SD Vista and CCB programs and, and looking at some more uh, usability and updates on safeguards and ideally some harmonization across programs. So I'll stop there. We put in this, this quote at the end. It's a bank Tesh actually recommended it, but I, I love it. I think it really recommend really kind of reflects our work. The future is uncertain, um, but the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So we're not waiting for that to be invented for us. We're, we're moving ahead on the changes we think need to be made to continue to enable action. And we're always cognizant of striking that balance between the VCS is a huge program. It has a lot of buy-in, it has a lot of success and strength, and we wanna to continue to allow people to invest and, and take action under the VCS while we're also making these improvements. So any improvement we make will have um, grace periods and, and phase-ins um, and lots of notice for people so that we can continue to improve and, and learn from the lessons in the market, but also support the projects that are there are very a, a lot of projects that are in various stages of development or execution under the program, and we want to make sure that those are supported. Um, sorry, I'll just I just need a second to read this question. It's a long one. But. Yeah. Well, I actually would ask um, who's ever asking the question for the sake of uh, keeping the 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 engagement going to ask your questions directly at this point. We have a good 20 minutes to, to have a discussion 
Um, so the floor is open to, to you, the audience. I see John, you've asked, so please go ahead. I'll work backwards. Cool. Um, oh, I think oh, Tyler's uh, question was answered. Great. No, no, okay. <laughs> this was answered, yeah. So you, you okay, great. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks so much for this uh, presentation. Um, I realize my questions are not all within, you know, the control of Vera. So uh, this is intended to provoke discussion more than anything. Um, but uh, one of the reflections I've had in developing our own carbon pilots is that we don't have sufficient supply side, um, supply side price discovery. So mm -hmm. what it costs to really uh, implement these projects to a high degree of integrity and complexity and um, quality, we we are hiring entire new teams and having to pull in consultants, and it's extra extremely hard to meet the um, some of the uh, the high bars set. But we do want to generate the most uh, the highest quality and integrity. And so, in my mind, it's not an issue of should we do it; it's an issue of how much should we be paid to do it by the market. And mm -hmm. so, I'm just wondering if there's any. Um, any thoughts about price discovery from Vera? If not, that's fine. I know it's not always your your purview on, on the market side. Um, and then the second question was about the Abacus label and SD Vista. Um, we're interested in SD Vista to try and look at co-benefits with smallholder farmers and to value those um, more coherently. And just any any insights you have on on the process at Vera and, and, and brainstorming you may have had about those labels. Uh, really important for us because we do a lot of agroforestry um, with yeah. smallholders. Uh, and then thirdly, um, um, I'm struggling to find global uh, transaction analysis uh, where I can just present internally or to externally to donors and, and leaders on like what what is the genuine likely demand for smallholder generated yeah. nature-based solutions credits over the next few years. And uh, I've seen lots of like huge forecast by McKinsey and others, but I haven't seen any any analysis on like segment specific transaction uh, price or volume uh, analysis. Uh, I might just not know enough. Uh, feel free to say, go here. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, all, all really good questions. Um, and it's an interesting side of the price discovery question because it it certainly comes up regularly and it's something we're thinking hard about for version five. But there's lots of different sides of price discovery. It's, you know, what are people paying at the, the final use? What, what, how much change in price is there in the various transactions, you know, from that initial buy from the project proponent through to the exchanges and, and eventual end user. Sometimes those are one and the same. And sometimes there could be, you know, three or four or 10 uh, transactions between credit generation and, and retirement. Um, so on, on the supply side price discovery of what does it cost to execute a project? That's a really interesting one. We've, I haven't heard it framed that way be heard before. I've definitely heard the like, how much of my money is going to the project? How much of my money is going to benefit sharing with the local community or that sort of thing versus just operational costs versus overhead in this, in the system, whether that's kind of administrative at the front end or brokerage fees and, and transaction fees. Um, so one of the things we're very seriously looking at is kind of a likely optional to start with, but enhanced financial disclosures for projects. So developing a standardized template for people to disclose their audited financials for their project and be able to say, you know, this is our operating costs, this is our investment costs, this is our cost of, of satisfying investment, you know, our cost of capital, this, these are our verification and reporting costs, these are our community benefit sharing uh, contributions and have that third party audited and, and disclosed, that would be kind of like the, the, you know, top ranking disclosure, and then maybe there would be a second order disclosure where you say, this is my community benefit sharing agreement, and this is my audited financial st statement saying, Yes, I, I'm an auditor. I've reviewed all the finances. They're all in order and they've fulfilled all their obligations to the community. Something like that where it would be, you know, not all of the dollars and cents, but an additional level of assurance that, that they're upholding all of the financial uh, obligations to workers and community benefit sharing, that sort of thing. Um, so I'd be curious to hear your, your reaction on those. Maybe actually I'll just, for the sake of conversation, I'll just pause and see if that's sort of what you're talking about before I get to the other questions. 
Yeah, that would be great. I mean, I think um, <clears throat> uh, to to follow on things, I don't want to hog the mic, but um, there's one key issue that we have, which is we're not sure of the additionality framework for grants versus debt versus mm. et cetera. And the reality is most of us are pre-financing significant pilot costs, at least with donor uh, funds. And there's no clear signal yet to say, uh, this was intended for generating carbon from mm -hmm. donors to say, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, or the pilot R and D phase is donor focused, and therefore, it it meets additionality criteria. Versus an agroforestry program, in some cases, where we've we've generated a lot of philanthropy yeah. to build that agroforestry program, but it wasn't intended to generate carbon credits. But in my mind, those smallholders should be eligible. So there's that mm -hmm. that that grant versus uh, direct uh, investment issue i'd be interested to explore more with with her at some stage and then secondly um i think in the process of doing the third party or financials i think that's a really good idea uh the third party audits and and more um, financial rigor i i suspect there will be a lot of hidden donor subsidies there too mm -hmm. in in the smallholder nbs space uh so certainly not in other uh sectors um but in in uh in my conversations with other ngos who have similar projects they're often kind of hiding their donor financials from mm -hmm. the carbon price. So what's happening is, is, is public sources of funding, philanthropy mainly, are significantly subsidizing the cost of carbon, and that's driving the price down. Mm -hmm. Because if we, if you took a real uh, price analysis approach, you would see that you know in our case, um, you would add another 25, 30 percent to the price of the carbon. And I, across the market, I, I would be really interested to understand if that's if that's genuinely an issue or if I, I'm just making it up. Uh, I, I do think it's a genuine issue because in the financing conversations I'm having with with large uh, financial institutions, they're saying, oh, this this NGO said that they can do it for this price or these financial terms on um, interest rates. Um, but uh, you're saying it's much more expensive. And that's we'd like, yeah. well, we showed you the full economic picture. That's why. Um, that's happening so I, I think it's a market-wide issue but i think what you're proposing does uh, address that to some degree yeah super interesting and and we've thought about that like other sources of financing issue too and maybe having that might be a rule that does have a requirement for everyone where it would be you must at least disclose if you're receiving other sources of funding and it becomes a double counting issue a little bit so you must disclose for the sake of proving that there is the you retain the rights to transact the carbon still despite receiving that that donor funding so it's both an additionality and a potential double counting question but it shouldn't be a problem like that is a great use of of donor funds to kickstart a project that can then become self-sustaining through carbon finance like that could be a you know a great uh success story for both the donors and and the carbon market if it's done Kind of all transparently and everybody knows uh how the different sides are working so yeah would love to follow up on that so feel free to follow up with me john uh on the second question the abacus label so we've finished can our I consultation just, yeah could i just intervene to ask if anyone else in in the audience oh, sure. is experiencing a similar or has had a similar reflection um especially if you're on the project development side okay just curious to know what um how relevant yeah. that is to you. Uh, and I don't did we answer the final question? No, I didn't. So okay. I'll I'll take them in order just quickly. The abacus one is quick. Um so for those of you that don't know, abacus is a label that was proposed. It's a market label. So labels are a thing that exist in the VCS where basically VCUs, so the units that are generated by projects, can be tagged. Um, by the registry as fulfilling certain kind of extra conditions in addition to the core requirements of the program. So the Abacus label, um, uh, Amazon, the company was was one of the main sponsors of it. It's a group of companies that are kind of looking at buying best in class nature based solutions. Um, obviously, with their name, there is a there's an interest in the Amazon uh, protection and conservation kind of topic as and so the abacus label is linked to afforestation reforestation uh, projects so our protocol is out the label consultation is done the feedback has been given back to 
um, the abacus group to review and, and make sure that they've addressed all of the comments that have been received and then they'll kind of submit their final proposed uh, framing and conditions for that to us for what projects would have to demonstrate to be able to achieve that label and then they would be able to access that group of of buyers that are interested in those kind of uh, specific specific version of high quality uh, there's lots of different definitions of quality but in this case really interested in the the afforestation uh, space so we would hope that that would be out um, you know kind of in the coming month or so probably q2 of of this year if if all goes well on the abacus side it's kind of on their desk right now um sd vista demand unfortunately i can't really speak to that uh, other than you know if i was to pull up the registry and and repeat back to you what what you can see there um so john feel free if there's a specific question for i can follow up with my sd vista team there, but I, I don't have a great sense of demand. Certainly we see a lot of labeled credits. Um, and when we see some of the reporting back from people who do some of the price surveys and stuff, we do see a premium on on credit price for like CCB labeled or SD Vista co-listed uh, credits. So I don't know about the independent demand. Um, I think we do see a bit of a premium for VCUs that hold those additional attributes uh, from the projects. Um, and then where can we find strong global transaction analysis? Uh, so super important and maybe slightly dangerous <laughs> question. So we don't issue this. Um, so I'm hesitant to recommend anyone in particular, but you know, just personally, I'm on the mailing list for like quantum intelligence. So they send a daily, daily and weekly note with a whole bunch of prices and kind of some news stories for the market. I'm also on the, the list for clear blue markets. They do a bunch of similar analytics some of the ratings agencies also do some market analytics so trove produces some interesting um stuff so those would be maybe the the three that i've read most recently no offense to anyone if if they have others that they look at and please i'd be curious to hear even from the group and maybe put it in the chat or speak up if if anyone else has others that they recommend or or maybe you're even partnered with um someone providing some of that market intelligence um, and then for the specific part on smallholder linked NBS credits, so uh, ClearBlue, well, all three of those actually do some different slicing of of the types of, of credits. I'm not sure if they have a smallholder NBS slice specifically for kind of price and volume, um, but they may. They certainly have a couple categories within the NBS grouping that they report out on. So it's always a question of you know, do they have enough people voluntarily giving them the information in their survey to roll it up and give a representative sample? One thing I would say is there's there is a very wide range that we see both anecdotally and in those data sets for the prices that people get. So I there is not a price for any given type of credit, let alone and especially not for the VCS. There's, you know, an order of magnitude of 100 at least difference in kind of the cheapest credit that somebody can find on the market to the highest price that somebody can get in the market. And that's part of the value proposition for some of the updates that we're doing is people could legitimately realize a 10x or more increase in the price of their credits, hopefully, if we can kind of demonstrate integrity and and satisfy what the buyers are looking for in the market. Yeah, that's still very much where we were about a year ago, no, in terms of the, flight, the, the price um, variance and um, lack of consensus, and at the same time on the project side needing to have enough of a floor price or a guarantee. Um, yeah, super. and it's legitimate variability, right? Because people prefer different things. Everybody has a different definition of quality and different like regional interests or project type interests. And if we look at the breadth of activities in the VCS, you know, it's everything from forest conservation to landfill gas capture to like CCS or biochar. So it's a huge variety of regions and project types. So a huge variety of costs and things that people value. So I think there's always going to be some of that fragmentation and, and um, specific nature of, of some of those deals, depending on if you mm -hmm. can match the buyer preference to the project type, then you can command a premium for that. Mm -hmm. 
So um, for those of you, Luke and Ty Tyler, you've asked questions and had them answered. Do you want any follow-up questions? Okay. And uh, we have about 10 minutes, so we can take a couple of questions more while we have Bankdesh and Justin with us. Yeah, and sorry to be so long-winded. I'll try to be more concise on the next ones, but <laughs> those were great questions, so. Oh, good information, thank you. Um, maybe I, I, you guys seem a little bit shy today, but uh, I, I do have a question, so I'll, I'll ask and give you um, a chance to, to, to follow up with that. Um, actually, you go ahead then and listen. Thanks, um, and thanks for joining us today um, from Vera. I'm, I'm curious, what are the areas where you need the most help? Like how could this group help mm. you in tackling your headaches? That's a great question and I love it. Um, I think like personally and selfishly, and I'm, I'm, I'd be curious to hear what Bangtesh says, but for the sake of updates to the program and updates to the methodologies, just getting the genuine feedback and intelligence from each person and the different role you're playing in, in the market. So if you're developing projects and you're seeing points of friction and you're just like, oh my God, why doesn't Vera fix this? It may just be because we don't know. Um, so please don't be shy about giving us that feedback. And that could be you know user experience type things. It could be like definitions that don't work or requirements that feel contradictory, things like that. If, if we can, find those problems that you're facing, we can help solve them. Um, and they can be from the like fundamentals to the pet peeve uh, type thing. So would would love to, you have my, my contact info, um, please feel free to get in touch with me. Also info at Vera uh, is kind of our general contact line and then program, I think it's program updates at vera.org is kind of my team's uh, email for, for the updates. So please, the, if you're facing problems in the market that are stopping you from taking action on climate, we want to remove those problems so that we can see more, more climate action. Great, thanks. Thanks, Elson. I see John has his hand up. I want to go next, Jen. I've already hogged the floor, so I, I can wait for yours. <laughs> oh, I don't mind. Okay. Well, I, mine was out. Oh, sorry, oh. Bankitesh. Sorry, Jane, but Bankitesh, did you have anything that, that you need in term, from your team? Certainly. Um, you said very, very important point uh, about what we need. I mean, we need a feedback. And I want to just uh, augment the same thing about if something is not um, in line in your thinking, we don't have to be bogged down by the process that we have. That can change. So suggest us with the ideas and approaches. We see comments like, oh, Vera is not doing enough on utilizing technology. Bring that technology to us. We will embed them into our process and pipeline. So we are open to that ideas. And um, I will just bring up, oh, everybody is doing AI, right? So. You might say, why doesn't Vera use AI? And we got some ideas on AI, but I don't know what you're thinking in terms of using AI. So give us those feedback and we will work uh, with you. And the real help would be if you are working on a project and you say Vera could do these things a little bit differently, be bold. And I had this stronger communication with other members where they were saying, your methodology is wrong. And I said, okay, it could be wrong, prove us and then I'll take it to the methodology team and then revise the methodology. It's just simply saying you are wrong is not sufficient. We can't act on that. But if you give us a data, this is why your methodology is wrong. We will be looking at those. And during yeah. this digital project pilot, we have been proven wrong and we have also proved others wrong. So it's a two way process. That's the real collaboration rather than simply saying it's not working. What is not working? Let's dig into it. How do we um, utilize technology to make things better for our integrity, our effort, and so on? So we are willing to get that collaboration. And moreover, what we want to do is reduce the cost overall so that climate benefit and community benefit can, can be you know, enhanced rather than spending money on things that could be avoided. That can only happen if we utilize, utilize technology at scale. 
So if you have data that we can utilize for monitoring, if you have some ideas that we can collaborate, I envision a scenario where project developers just develop the project, something else can monitor and quantify the benefit for them. So that's where we want to go. Uh, we are open to those ideas and uh, getting any collaboration, any support, any partnership. That's that's what I, I want to say. It's longer, but you know. Thanks, Fantash. I think the spirit of that is is pretty welcome. And you know, there there I think at least I saw two um, other organizations that have their own methodologies, and um, there's that tension, right, of existing methodologies and the market itself evolving and. Um, trying to figure out where it's going to land, what a particular convergence around the methodology means, um, access to those methodologies, the, the usability of it. So it, it is it is refreshing to hear. And at the same time, um, you know, how do how do how do, how do the different supply and demand sides re react to that? Uh, Sadia, you were asking a question as well. Would you like to chime in? We lose you. Um, well, you are on mute. So maybe just quickly, Sadia was asking if um, Vera is working with project developers in Pakistan, and are they what's the response to DRMRV? Uh, from the DMRV perspective, there is one entity working with us. Uh, how many project developers are in Pakistan? I don't know, but you can find that information in the registry itself. Yeah, yeah, I don't know off the top of my head either, but. Um, certainly active in, in Pakistan and that, that entire region. Great. Thank you. Um, and we have uh, five more minutes and, um, maybe it was John, no, you had a question still. Yeah. I, I have a long list, long wish list, uh, <laughs> from Vera. So I won't Great. bore you now with it. I think our team is already in touch with your team, but I can't remember who from which side, um, okay. but um, <clears throat> two things to throw out there. One, uh, the main question I have is, can we? is there a world in which we can move from project-based certification and financing to portfolio-based? You know, mm -hmm. when ECFAM works across nine countries and if we had an ability to blend a portfolio where some countries like Tanzania have very difficult policy uh, issues with carbon markets, but Rwanda has very positive developments in that area. We may scale up or down in those markets mm -hmm. over time. Uh, and my dream world scenario is to have a portfolio like that, which is not so strictly penalizing us if we run into issues in one country or another. Mm -hmm. And then the second um, wish list is is um, around uh, area-based um, work. We, we distribute agroforestry seedlings to whole uh, countries and regions now with smallholder farmers and, and we're not able to access carbon markets because of um, permanence requirements and, and because of uh, the way area um, based approaches are, are currently laid out. Um, hmm. So I think that's going to be an issue for a lot of people at scale. Uh, we worked with you on the area based standard with with ARR. So uh, it's not like a criticism of Vera, but we're finding like it's impossible to do baselines and dynamic baselines in hmm. these contexts, etc. So I think that's a longer discussion. But um, uh, that that was my question more on the portfolio and national level. Yeah, the portfolio one is interesting. Um, I'd be curious what you think Vera's role is. Like we we certainly do see people offering portfolio products at like downstream of the project side, where you know a a, a broker or even a project proponent is doing a number of projects and then marketing that and and transacting that as a portfolio and you know if you buy 100 credits from them then you get one from tanzania and two from rwanda and you know whatever the proportional breakdown is so there is a little bit of that kind of risk distribution or attribute distribution through portfolios happening in the market side um so yeah please feel free to follow up in terms of what you think is needed on on the standard side we want to be, it's a time where there's increased scrutiny and increased demand for kind of quality and, and assurance and making sure the I's are dotted and the T's are, are crossed. So it, it would be probably a tough sell if it's for the sake of 
giving a little bit more slack for one region because there's extra rigor in another region, but maybe there's a way to do it and, and certainly unlocking smallholder projects and like indigenous partnerships and things like that. We do recognize that there are different needs for some of those communities and contexts and ideally we want climate action to be truly happening everywhere around the world as much as possible as soon as possible so I, I think there is room for a conversation there but nothing specifically in the works on the program update side to enable that. Yeah, I, I like the, um, it made me think about the, Lucas, Luke just jumped off, but he was from the OFP side and they did a brown bag with us as well. Mm. And part of how they were contributing to the permanence aspect is that they were pooling, every, every, every project is contributing to a pool. So it's almost as if they over- yeah. So that is how the permanence uh, buffer works. So every project contributes based on its own risk analysis, but it goes into a pooled buffer yeah. account. If there's yeah. a reversal, it's the project's obligation first to make that up, but then the pool is there to backstop that. So that's that's how we've unlocked kind of nature-based projects that have that permanence risk is by pooling the risk across the portfolio. And that's the strength of, of the size of the Vera portfolio is we can do that. So if a you know, huge wildfire season happens in Canada like it did last year, there's a whole bunch of other projects, other places that are offsetting some of that risk at any given point in time. Yeah. And so similarly, if that translatable to the portfolio at the country level, I'm just mm -hmm. um, maybe think of that. Okay, well, thank you so much for your curiosity and um, Bangladesh and, and Justin in particular for your time and sharing your uh, knowledge and, and um, insights. I'm going to pause here and respect our time, but uh, yeah, I just want to thank everyone for being um, participatory and uh, we'll schedule the next brown bag. Hopefully you've learned something and made connections today. Um, so thank you for joining us and hopefully see you at the next one. Great. Thanks, Jane. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for participating. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Bye.